measured angles and could also be used to chart a course across the desert or over the seas by night or day. Incorporating star maps and astronomical tables, it remained for centuries the most elaborate and versatile instrument known to science, the timepiece and slide rule of the ancient world. The ancient designs are still used today to reproduce these instruments of antiquity, copied with the same skill and craftsmanship as their originals. Nowadays, there are a number of instruments based on the same principles. For surveying, there's the theodolite, an instrument as basic to civil engineering now as the astrolabe was to medieval Islam. For navigation, the sextant, used in the same way to measure angles between the horizon and the sun by day and the stars by night. These astrolabes made between the 10th and 18th centuries, are from the period in which Islamic astronomy was the most advanced in the world. During the Dark Ages, before the Renaissance in Europe, Islamic scholars kept alive the accumulated knowledge of earlier civilizations. The Prophet has said, Seek knowledge, even into China. And, Seeking knowledge is obligatory to every Muslim. Muslim explorers travelled widely and made maps of their discoveries. This is the world geography of Al Idrisi, completed in 1154. He also produced this map, which shows an extensive knowledge of the whole Mediterranean basin. Islamic geographers knew the world was a globe and mapped it in spherical projection. Then, as now, the center of the Muslim world was the Kaaba, the holy shrine in Mecca. It was the focus of a religion that embraced every aspect of life, including the pursuit of scientific knowledge. Muslim cartographers drew their maps with north at the bottom, but turned to the view more familiar to modern eyes, the Kaaba remains the center. It was from Mecca in 622 AD that the influence of the Prophet's teachings began its remarkable spread. Within 11 years, it had embraced most of Arabia. And a few years later, Egypt, Syria, Mesopotamia and Persia. Subsequently, the Muslim world was to stretch from Samarkand and the Valley of the Indus in the east to Andalusia and Marrakesh in the west. The lasting strength of Islam's astonishing expansion lay in its offering of a new, unified culture. The inspiration of the Quran and of the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet, was its most powerful driving force. The Holy Quran says, We will show them our signs in all the regions of the earth and in their souls until they see that this is the truth. Throughout Islam, the pursuit of knowledge was not simply admired, it was revered. Scholars travelled vast distances to study under a great teacher. By studying the phenomena of the physical world around him, man could perceive the underlying principles of God's creation and so fulfil the ultimate purpose of his existence. The Prophet has said, Verily, the men of knowledge are the inheritors of the Prophets. One of Islam's greatest contributions to the world was to preserve and build on the knowledge of past civilizations. Translated into Arabic, this would later be transmitted to the West. The ancients understood, for instance, the medicinal use of plant and herbal extracts, knowledge which the Arabs collected and codified as they did that of the animal kingdom. Their texts include references to creatures from the farthest reaches of the known world. Islamic astronomers also built on past knowledge 
and created the most precise observational instruments yet known. Ulug Beg, ruler and leading astronomer of Samarkand, built this observatory in the 15th century. There was an intense interest in the structure and motions of the heavens. Over the centuries, astronomical phenomena were meticulously observed and recorded. The modern heliocentric view of the solar system is largely derived from this enormous collection of Islamic data. Without access to Islamic knowledge, many of the crucial discoveries on which modern science rests might well have been postponed for generations. Even as late as the 18th century, the observatories at Delhi and Jaipur, built to 12th century Muslim designs, were producing records of unparalleled accuracy. Perhaps the greatest single achievement of Islamic thinkers was to democratize mathematics, to make it a tool that could be used by ordinary people. In earlier times, the symbols used for numbers were additive. If x stood for 10, xx would be 20, xxx 30, and so on. Other symbols stood for different values. It was a clumsy and elaborate system, in which multiplication could only be done by successive additions. The introduction of the decimal system was a great step forward. It originated in India, but was developed and brought into everyday use by the Arabs, Arabic numerals. In this system, each number has not only a face value, but a place value. Crucial to its working is the concept of zero. With zero and the other nine ciphers, every possible number can be represented. Basic mathematical principles and definitions were adopted from the Greeks. But in algebra, trigonometry and geometry, Islamic mathematicians made enormous advances. This is Atusi's 13th century proof of Pythagoras' theorem. The square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. In his book, Keys to the Science of Astronomy, Al-Biruni produced the first independent work on trigonometry. This had many practical applications. For example, to find the width of a river, x. If a set distance was placed out at right angles along the bank and an angle measured, the equation would give the answer. Similarly, if the distance between two offshore islands was known and an angle measured, x, the distance from the shore, could be calculated. The method was also used in the construction of underground aqueducts. An equation would give the length of horizontal tunnel needed to reach the bottom of the access shaft. This vital branch of mathematics was developed in its entirety by the Arabs. The fundamental equations deduced by Al-Biruni as early as the 11th century. This concern with mathematics, especially geometry, is related to the Islamic doctrine of unity. God is one. The symbol of divine unity is the circle, and it's the basis of all Islamic art and architecture. Thank you.
For desert peoples, water held a particular significance and fascination, and great ingenuity went into its management and manipulation. In the mountains of Oman, for instance, an irrigation system called a phalange, built in the Middle Ages, is still in use today. Water flows along carefully contoured channels. In places, the water travels underground, even under great stretches of desert, through tunnels built by connecting a series of vertical shafts. Eventually, it emerges at its final destination, miles away from the mountains. Islamic texts, such as al Jazari's Book of Knowledge of Ingenious Mechanical Devices, are full of inventive ideas. In 1205, he designed this pump for raising and distributing water. It exists only in replica now, but many other devices built in the Middle Ages are still in use. This giant water wheel is at Hama in Syria. By the 14th century, Islamic engineers had not only learned how to harness water, but also the wind and animal power. Many designs were produced simply to show off the inventor's virtuosity. This plan for a clock operated by a complicated flow of water was produced in 1358. A contemporary model demonstrates its ingenuity. Islamic craftsmen also made innovations in the design of more conventional clocks. Everything they made shows this same combination of technical virtuosity, precision of craftsmanship, and deep concern for beauty. The prophet has said, God has ordained excellence for everything. This astronomical calculating machine, made in the Caliphate of Baghdad in the 13th century, is perhaps the most astonishing example of mathematical understanding allied to mechanical expertise. Even such utilitarian objects as padlocks show this delight in creating complex mechanisms. Some of them display an astonishing originality. importance were portable sundials to indicate to the devout Muslim the times laid down for prayer. For the traveler there was a further problem. Prayers had to be said facing Mecca. Its direction, known as the Qibla, had somehow to be determined from anywhere on earth. Fortunately the magnetic compass was known in Islam long before it was adopted in Europe. Ingenious devices called Qibla indicators solved the problem, indicating both time and direction. Other instruments, like this early Turkish quadrant, could be used to determine latitude and also to make astronomical observations.
A surprising number of instruments used for geometry and surveying, still familiar today, were the invention of Islamic scientists. Because in Islam there is no arbitrary separation made between the arts and the sciences, technical perfection always went hand in hand with beautiful decoration. Modern instruments have their own functional beauty, but here science and art are divorced. The unified approach to life inherent in Islam produced skills and craftsmanship unsurpassed in their day, supplying the tools and instruments for scientists of many disciplines, among them medicine and pharmacology. Interest in herbs and drugs stemmed from the Muslim belief that in nature God provides the cures for all man's illnesses. The apothecary shop was full of these tokens of God's generous attitude to mankind. The Prophet has said, a believer strong in body and spirit is better and more loved by God than a weak one. Islamic pharmacology was derived from the Greek Dioscorides. His Materia Medica, listing 500 plants and their uses, was translated into Arabic in the 9th century. By 1248, Ibn al-Baytar had produced the classic Muslim work on the subject, listing over 1,400 drugs of vegetable, animal and mineral origin. Knowledge of anatomy was also advanced, and the functions of the body were broadly understood by the 17th century. Even earlier, a long history of clinical observations and systematic record-keeping had led to the successful treatment of a great variety of ailments. Cauterization was widely used, and dentistry was also practiced with considerable skill. Generations of practical experience went into the successful treatment of dislocations and fractures. Even today, similar treatments are widely practiced. Eyes were specially at risk in these dusty desert lands, and their study was given particular attention. It was over a thousand years ago that Ibn al-Haytham made the fundamental discovery that we see by registering rays of light coming from an object to the eye. Up to that time, it had always been assumed that the reverse was the case. Ibn al-Haytham made many important contributions to the science of optics. One of his most fascinating studies was of the effect of parabolic and spherical mirrors. He also made the fundamental discovery that a ray of light always travels along the shortest path. The science of optics was obviously dependent on the skills of the glassmakers, but their products had many other uses. For carrying water in the desert, for sprinkling fragrant rose water in the home. But the most significant use of glass was in the manufacture of the equipment used in chemistry. Islamic scientists were the first to carry out objective experiments. Alembic, alkali, alcohol are all Arabic words. The process of distillation, used to produce all kinds of elixirs and chemical preparations, was perhaps their greatest discovery. We use the same method today. Distillation is the fundamental process in the refining of oil and the production of petrochemicals. The ways of the world have changed, almost out of all recognition. But the religion founded in Mecca nearly 1400 years ago still influences every aspect of Muslim life and culture. A culture which could comprehend the mystical meaning of the cosmos and at the same time map the constellations of the universe.